Jesus, if we look down, it takes a microscope. No. Hello? You can start. Hello. Distinguished guests, thank you for being here uh, in this uh, marvelous event, uh, as it were. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, our panel, uh, starting with uh, the lady to my right, which is Mrs. Uh, uh, Pritha Reddy, Vice Chairperson for Apollo Hospitals. Uh, past president for AIMA India, I hope I spelled that correctly. Uh, then again, to, uh, further to my uh, right is uh, Mr. Niraj Saran, the CEO and uh, co-founder of uh, Aura Industrial Systems uh, Thank from you, the US. Uh, immediately to my left is uh, Mr. Spiro Papas. Uh, he is uh, the uh, uh, Vice uh, Chairperson for uh, Open Learning, as it were. And Mr. Vinit Agarwal, he's the Managing uh, Director for Tran the Transport Corporation of India. Thank you, our Indian friends, for making the effort to, uh, to come here and talk to us. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, in our initial thoughts for uh, beginning our, uh, our interesting uh, talk, I would like to point out uh, the following. Uh, as we have seen in previous uh, talks uh, today, there is a lot of emphasis uh, for the IMEC corridor and uh, what really connects uh, the two countries in uh, whichever way from uh, being uh, uh, two uh, uh, democracies, as it were, one larger than the other, but one older than the other. So we, we have our own uh, qualities, as it were. Uh, and uh, I would also like to point out a very interesting thought that I picked up in the previous uh, session, uh, which literally translates to the following. The IMEC corridor connecting India and Greece, a distinguished gentleman said, should be more than just a transport corridor. It should be a corridor that would create a whole uh, set of uh, value chains, uh, as it were, uh, connecting the two countries in such a way that will make the, uh, the, the corridor relevant, not just for today, but for the next 10 years. Uh, in uh, that sense, uh, I would uh, like uh, you to uh, give us uh, initial thoughts based on the know-how and uh, your respective sectors of industry, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Spiro Papas, uh, uh, since you are coming from uh, the world of uh, open learning, uh, remote learning and the relevant capabilities, what are your initial thoughts on our subject? Yeah, no, George, I think um, I'm glad you, you pointed out that um, it should, the focus should be more than just on um, you know, the physical infrastructure. I think it's really important that we, we, we look at the, the challenge of uh, preparing all of our citizens and all of our economies uh, for the world that's, come, that's here with us now, the digital era, and that, that also means our human capital, our people, because uh, there's going to be a tremendous need for reskilling, and um, the, the way we've done things candidly to date uh, you know, w w will not suffice for where we need to get, go to uh, in, a, in a modern AI-enabled economy. And, and so um, that, that would be my initial um, thought on All response right. to your question. Yeah. Thank you, Spiro. Uh, dear Pritha, you're coming from the world of uh, healthcare. And uh, we know that uh, India has been uh, at the forefront uh, of uh, development, both in the scientific field, but also on the development of uh, human capital and uh, the respective uh, uh, values, uh, value chains. Um, uh, having said that, uh, we all know that uh, Greece and, uh, in fact, uh, Europe in general is facing uh, a set of uh, uh, complications and challenges uh, which are uh, literally up your alley. Um, and uh, how 
are you perceiving the, the, the issue? How can we connect the two countries using that kind of technology? Thank you, but uh, I'm just going to digress. Uh, you asked a question about the IMAC corridor. Yes. And for us to go back in history, there was the Silk Route, which everybody knows about. The Silk Route was not just a trading route. Around the Silk Route, there was uh, civilizations developed. It was a trade route for silk and spices and so many other things. But communities developed around it. And there was a whole civilization which was part of the Silk Route. I'm using this, that as an analogy. Mm -hmm. And how do we have you know, corridors? How do we have country partnerships which are closer and which develop an ecosystem? Uh, I will stick to healthcare, and I know that we have challenges. But simply because of the proximity in culture, simply because of the proximity in the way we can handle education, I think there's a lot we can do, do together. Uh, there are two issues with healthcare, uh, which is a challenge. And one is a huge aging population. You know, world over, globally, there is an issue of aging population. And there is a lack of skilled uh, personnel, not only to handle the immediate needs of healthcare, but also to take care of the aging population. So I think we need to find uh, plans, uh, designs, risk mitigation strategy to deal with these issues. And that is where probably you know, technology would come in as an answer. Uh, better forms of skilling for, for staff and uh, also a, a, a kind of risk and reward system because today I know, you know we run hospitals. Uh, we have about 14, 15,000 hospital beds in the country. But our agenda today, and it's very relevant to the topic, is to keep people out of hospitals. You know, if there's any banker or private equity might be wondering why am I doing this about my business. But the thing is, it pays uh, for a country, for economic prosperity, and for a company like ours to actually keep people out of hospitals. And that is where the answers lie, that can, you know, can we have plans, can we have strategies to keep people healthy, keep them well, and train our youth to take care, because I think uh, there's a huge business in, um, in the healthcare personnel, skilled healthcare personnel, uh, for the globe. You know, everywhere countries are struggling with it. So like there was an IT revolution, and we were training engineers and information technology uh, personnel to go all over the world and work, I think now countries like ours should train healthcare personnel to answer these challenges. Thank you. These are very interesting uh, thoughts that uh, are touching uh, the lives of uh, many people uh, for the future. Uh, moving on to uh, Vanit, uh, uh, since you are in the sector of uh, transportation and infrastructure, uh, what would your uh, take be on the issue, uh, uh, keeping in mind what uh, uh, our previous speaker said about the need to uh, connect, communicate, and use the, the technology that is available? So specifically, <clears throat> if you look at the IMEC corridor, uh, IMEC, uh, it, is, uh, it is going to be a channel of development for the entire range of activities that is going to happen there. It's uh, from India, Middle East, Europe. And the connectivity is not going to be only from an infrastructure perspective, which we know has already started, uh, with India investing into ports in Israel, in, um, in uh, uh, Greece, and uh, in several other countries. But people-to-people uh, -people movement, uh, like what uh, Rita just mentioned, mentioned. Uh, it will happen on um, uh, creating industries because there will be the ports that are going to be around will create industries. For example, India and uh, Greece can collaborate on shipbuilding. Uh, we as a company are buying ships. In incidentally, we placed an order for two ships just last month to China. And I'm, it was just unavoidable because there was no other company or country that came up and said, not even in India, that they didn't come up to that price expectation, uh, or uh, to some extent the quality as well. So those are the things that the IMEC should be working, will work on to build up capacity uh, across this board uh, for industry, for uh, infrastructure, for uh, creating people-to-people -people movements, 
and ultimately also even for uh, cultural exchange. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, great uh, initial thoughts. Mr. Niraj, it's uh, up to you, being in the uh, technology and construction um, sector. Give us our thoughts. Thank you, George. So uh, since the subject today is about coherent technologies and uh, disruptions that technology has brought and is bringing in the future, let me first take a very macro view and then break it down to four different steps that I want to talk about and bring relevance to what we can do between India and Greece. Uh, first and foremost, uh, India is best described as a civilization, so is Greece, right? So it's good to have uh, two civilizations sitting here and talking about what we can do in the future. If you go back in time, civilizations always want humanity to be more safer, more closer, more healthier, and more efficient. And, and I'm going to try and look at it from a technology perspective because that's what we're talking about. And the, the, not the white elephant anymore, there is AI here, and it's here to stay and we need to adopt. So I would have four quick points, very quick points around this. The first one is pace. I mean, honestly, 18 months back, who had heard of AI and chat GPT? Very few people had heard about it. And uh, today, Every bedroom, boardroom, classroom, every room in the world, AI and chat GPT is there. Uh, you know, you could spend all your life reading a book 24 seven, and you would probably reach about 8 billion words. And in the nascent first phase of AI, it can do 8 trillion in a month's time. So look at the pace. We've already had more than 1 billion use cases where AI has been deployed by individuals and companies in the last 18 months. So this is the pace that we must acknowledge that we are dealing with. The second point is the inflection point. I think today we are at an inflection point in humanity, thanks to AI. And by far, it is going to be the fastest and the most consequential impact we would have ever seen. That's the inflection point. I mean, very soon, businesses, every business will have their own AI. Of course. Every individual will have their own AI. So that's the kind of inflection point we are talking about. What do we do with this? Fix problems, accelerate growth. So, just to give an example, India is using small models of AI and has already been deploying in the ag sector, in the ed ed education sector, and uh, she knows more than anyone else how it's actually changing diagnostics in, in a dramatic manner, quick, fast, more precise. But you'll be surprised about what I'm going to say one more thing. In the last three years, the fastest growth sector of India in the export is defense. Why? Because most of these defense products that are going out of India have some AI embedded in it. This is not about artillery. This is about defense systems. So that is the profoundness of what we are talking about and, and fixing and accelerating growth. Coming to India, Greece, this is, I feel that, uh, let's face it, Silicon Valley, and I have my roots there as well, quite a bit, that Silicon Valley has been the cradle of AI, and I think will continue to be in the forefront of coming up with new things. And Silicon Valley is banking heavily on India because of the, you know, five million programmers and more than specifically more than 100,000 developers of AI already. And in the next three years, we'll have half a million trained, skill developed AI people in India, right? And, and so this is where I think the opportunity lies. Um, India is seeking partnership. It's a seeking partnership in Europe with everyone who's got a positive agenda and is willing 
to also accept the rise of India. India is discovering the world and the world is discovering India in some way, if I could use that dichotomy. And we are looking at partnerships and I think this is where Greece comes into play very, very quickly. That uh, we can partner in the tech space and I'm talking at the macro level because when you collaborate at the tech space, as Spira said, AI, tools, tackles, this is pervasive. It's going to go to every industry, maritime, food, agriculture. So I'm looking at the macro that I think we need to come together. How do we do it is a big question. I do believe one thing that making policy is one thing and going on the ground is another thing and getting it done. Greece is high on SME sector, small sectors. So is India. The large corporates don't need help, trust me. The large corporates, they know their way, they've got what it is. How do you connect the small sectors, both in India and Greece, to adopt this new technology and actually bring about changes that both the countries need? We are growth, India's growth is high, but we need to employ more. You have also challenges of employment in this country, hmm. right? So this is where I think collaborations can happen. I'll stop at this point with these thoughts and we'll take it from here. Thank you. Uh, these are extremely helpful uh, points, uh, setting the scene. And uh, actually, I'm uh, back to you, Spiro. Yes. Uh, because there are a few things that uh, have come up from uh, Niraj's uh, narration. Yes. Uh, we are talking about uh, the need for uh, the creation. He literally, and I'm going to quote, every company will have their own AI. Yeah, yeah. So, what does this mean? No, so, uh, Exxon took a lot of good notes there, Norwich. Thank you. That was uh, very well distilled. I think, um, George, it's, it is a fascinating time. I think the, I agree with everything that has been said in terms of the pace. I don't think people, just to give you one, statistic that you know obviously if you look at other disruptive de de technologies and their deployment over um, general purpose technologies like electricity the steam engine you know the internet one took a hundred years one took decades the other one took a decade literally ChatGPT deployed to a hundred million users within two months and and so you're <laughs> the, the pace of this is just so profound but there, and there is a but. Um, I think, as they say, the devil is in the detail and being able to, to deploy uh, a general purpose technology like a large language model um, for certain use cases will make a lot of sense. So you can use a generic large language model like um, ChatGPT, for instance, for, for the creative economy. If you're just quickly wanting to go through content and, and just distill the content, get, uh, extract what you need, and it sort of doesn't need to be 100% accurate, 70, 80% accurate is good enough, then that's, that's obviously a, a great productivity saving because you can do it a lot faster and, and, and then obviously you can tailor it. But there are certain, uh, to Naraj's point, the w applications in certain specific industries will require a lot more customization and a lot more specific training for, to eliminate or minimise hallucinations and also to get you to, to the point where you can uh, be confident that it's accurate enough and reliable enough as a model and that you have the right safeguards in place as well in order to, um, to be able to deploy within a enterprise environment. So it's one thing obviously, you know, practising for exams and doing creative stuff, but it's another thing to then put it into a bank or an, or an accounting firm or a legal firm, which is what we're talking about here. And um, so that presents a, a real challenge um, and a real practical challenge, but make no mistake, I agree with what, what was said by the, our other esteemed colleagues here, there's uh, panel members, there's, it's coming and it's coming fast. And um, all of the, the only other point I'd make here is that, just to reinforce the point that Naraj made, is the, the actual, Unlike previous uh, general purpose technologies and when they were deployed, uh, if you think about the steam engine, obviously you, you needed to develop the, the rail infrastructure, you needed to develop all the infrastructure. 
um, in the case of um, you know, the, the, the world we're living in now, we have the internet, we have cloud infrastructure, um, and we have um, you know, uh, the other necessary ingredients, uh, enablers, if you like. Um, clearly, we're going to need a lot more of it. We're, we're going to need more NVIDIA chips, more GPUs, more... Uh, we're going to need a lot more energy, hopefully re renewable. We're going to need... And this is not discussed uh, a lot, but for data centres, for AI uh, data centres, they, they chew up, they create a lot of heat. So we're going to need a lot of water. So there's a whole bunch of stuff here that, um, that you need to think through as you deploy. And uh, I, I think India, there's, there's, there's some tremendous um, engineers and know-how and people that can help Greece on that journey. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, especially the points that uh, we're talking about also the requirements for physical infrastructure as well. Yes. Yep. Uh, because people forget that uh, uh, the cloud does not exist. It's somebody else's computer, basically. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, uh, this creates another set of uh, issues. Uh, for example, the given uh, regulatory framework and legal framework in uh, Europe uh, requires for certain uh, sensitive technologies, you also mentioned defense, uh, as it were, uh, that they be uh, under the strict purview of, uh, uh, of the, the EU framework and the national legal framework. Uh, so uh, there will be no instances uh, of uh, uh, um, maybe getting it into the wrong hands uh, of state or non-state uh, actors. So let's uh, keep that in mind. Uh, that uh, this creation of, uh, of, uh, of the technology and the capabilities uh, will have uh, to have a certain uh, regulatory aspect to it. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, as uh, you said, the big right, one. Yes, a big one. Uh, uh, the, 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 the people, the guys in Silicon Valley are interested in uh, India. Uh, I'm sure that Europe is also interested in India as well. Uh, but uh, the challenges of the regulatory aspects uh, will have to be an uh, issue at uh, the end of it. Uh, and this will require more interaction with uh, the two countries, uh, more co coordination and uh, more development of uh, common frameworks that will be able to, uh, uh, to come out of that. However, having said that, I would like to uh, go back to, uh, to you, Pritham. Uh, with respect uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, healthcare, um, could you give us per, uh, perhaps an idea of uh, how India has been using new technologies uh, so far uh, for hospital use, but also in personal healthcare as well, getting people out of the hospital, uh, also dealing with an aging population, which I'm sure for India is not an issue. Uh, but uh, given the scale of the population, uh, it may not be a critical issue, but it is still an issue that you are probably tackling as we speak. So one is I wanted to just say that, uh, you know, India is a very attractive resource for data. And uh, we constantly having people saying, you know, we need data for this and data for that. And the government of India has put in very stringent rules. And it's, I think it's a good thing about our Data Protection Act and how personal data, and I'm talking healthcare purely, uh, has to be anonymized and it has to be protected. And I think that's one of the best moves because otherwise people tend to become very vulnerable. And I think our government's done a great job on that. Using technology for progress, um, you know, one of the earlier speakers, Vineet said it, that in the past 10, 15 years, the way India has progressed has been phenomenal. And uh, people now have access to high quality healthcare. There is always a question about affordability. And that's where they have uh, very innovative schemes for people. You know, sometimes you pay just one rupee a day, sometimes less than one dollar a day sometimes to get the highest quality of healthcare. You know, you can have the best in class of cancer treatment, cardiac treatment, because you're providing access and it's the sheer scale and numbers which gives you, so that's the financial innovation, you know, financial access. 
Then we have an issue of geographical access, you know, their remote locations, their villages. And I think that's been a global learning for multiple other countries who've now come to India and said, give us the answer of how you provide geographical access. And this is where India today is the largest telemedicine provider in the world. And I don't think that, you know, that people know about it, but an institution like ours does Pure telemedicine consults upwards of 4,000 a day. Every day there are about 4,000, and this is just one institution in the country. There are multiple others doing it. And I'm saying this because this is one of the single largest innovations which has happened uh, in our country and globally, that we've been able to provide geographical access. And if that can be replicated, you know, we don't have to worry about somebody being in a remote location. Uh, we do consults for Australia, which is, you know, the, uh, somebody living in a completely remote location. We do it in Africa. We do it in the highest point in the Himalayas. And all this has happened because of adoption of technology. It, you know, it hasn't happened just because somebody took a magic wand and said, I want to talk to someone, I want to consult. It's happened because there's been a systematic adoption of a technology. The second innovation which we see coming is the fact that we do not have enough people manpower globally. It's a problem around the world for diagnostics, for quick, accurate, fast diagnostics, which can be technology driven. And that's where the, the utilization of AI to be able to say that if you do a radio, radiology imaging, MRI, CT, CT, ultrasound, can the machine guide you to a better diagnosis so that you don't miss something which you know, can be dramatically life-threatening. And I think that has been adopted not only in the private sector healthcare, which is you know, conceived as you can afford to do it, you can do it, but the government is adopting this. And you know, I think the fact that uh, our government, government of India has uh, increased the healthcare spend from, it used to be 1.6% of the GDP, it's gone to 3.6% of our GDP and it's he uh, heading towards 5% of GDP. And so adoption of technology has become not only the role of private sector, but has become the uh, role of uh, you know, the public sector also. So I think in early diagnostic, in diagnostics it's happening. But the exciting move which is there is that you know, the onset of disease is, is a huge global burden. The, every country is grappling with it. But with genomics and analysis of data, some of the large <coughs> genomic projects, uh, the NHS is doing it, uh, the Emirates are doing it, uh, Saudi is doing it, that India potentially can become the back end for processing of genomic data. And you know, give it back to that country so that they can intervene quick, faster, and early intervention, especially in healthcare, make a huge difference. So I think these are some of the landscapes, apart from the fact that you know you can use drones to go and deliver medicines in remote locations, which is being done, and vaccines are moving from one place to other. So you're using all that. But I think these are the path-breaking technologies which are happening. Can, can I add one fun, fun layer to this? I shall allow this. Yeah? So there is a fun layer, you know, she's taught, everything is nice, but let me bring a, a fun layer of AI and technology in it, which is also a policy and ethical question. Uh, imagine yourself two years from now, we all have iPhone, Samsung, whatever, you know, it's taking your parameters, you know, so it, it can predict in some ways uh, the, the disease that you may be progressing towards, right? Very nice, right? This is the good part of it. So you know beforehand that you may have diabetic issues or whatever, whatever issues. But here's the fun part, and that's where my question is, and that's where we all need to really think hard <coughs> and deep to address this question because it's both advocacy and ethical. Now, the same AI is with the insurance companies also. <laughs> they know you're gonna fall sick. So do you think they will insure you up your insurance premium? How will they handle it? 100%. So, you, you get I my mean, point. I'm trying to bring out they will the AI part and the technology part, which this forum is all about, that there is a lot of things happening and we are just not able to grapple. And the advocacy and the policy is so behind. Mm. 
that we need to be very careful in crafting all this for the benefit of humanity. Otherwise, we're going to be in big, big trouble. And I'll come to that, the perils later. Excellent. That's uh, great. Thank you for the initiative. But we've, before, because I can see you no, no, I mean, <laughs> ready, ready to bounce. Yeah. No, no, no. But uh, before we, uh, we move into that, I would like to uh, hear from uh, you, Vinit. Uh, what is your uh, experience on the use of... Um, ah, don't worry about it. Uh, what's the use of uh, uh, this specific technology in the Indian uh, transport uh, uh, sector? I think you are one of, the, one of the right people to have on this uh, panel. Uh, and this might give us an idea uh, on uh, what are going to be uh, the paradigms coming out of that uh, for the uh, upcoming connections between, uh, hopefully, between uh, Greece and India. Uh, the, the, the point of the question is the following. If you look at the map, and uh, being in Greece, uh, we like to point out that uh, many words are Greek, and one of them is geography. Uh, and uh, us being a democracy is at the end of our respective areas. So we have uh, Greece at the, basically the end of uh, the European Union, the very edge. Um, uh, and then uh, there is a whole uh, area of geopolitical trouble, another interesting uh, Greek word, uh, as it were. Uh, then we have India as a major, major, uh, huge democracy. Um, uh, this is the paradigm that... Uh, we are, be, we are going to be looking to investigate in the future uh, by using technology. Uh, uh, long question, but uh, I need to point out that uh, from a logistics point of view, it is at least interesting, isn't it, to connect the two countries. How can we project whatever happened in India and use it to connect these two points of reference? You leave all the tough questions for me, right? Of course. <laughs> okay, well... Um, so I'll give examples of what's happening in logistics in India and uh, on how data is being, you know, data is now the fourth factor of production. Uh, land, labor, capital, now data is the next one. So uh, it is with India's population that we've heard many times today repeated, the geographical spread. Um, we have 600,000 villages in the country. It is difficult for any delivery company to really deliver to your house. So you could say that, look, I live behind that temple in that uh, street uh, next to the well and with the door, red door. That's my address. And it gets delivered there every single time with, I would say, a failure rate of less than 0.01%. So why is that happening and how is that happening on a regular and continuous basis? It's because of data. Uh, the e-commerce companies have all that data. Now what's happening subsequent to the next stage of development with e-commerce is something called quick commerce. And quick commerce is essentially, you will get anything about, about the top 2,000, 3,000 SKUs items in your house within eight to 10 minutes and I have timed it many times. Within eight to 10 minutes, in some cases 12 minutes, the product is delivered to your house. It is completely changing the e-commerce landscape in the country. It's a combination, the, the process is that there is a fulfillment warehouse at the back, and then in the city there are these dark stores or small, uh, smaller warehouses uh, where there are a few hundred SKUs, and finally the last mile delivery to your house. So like we do some of this in the supply chain in our businesses. And uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, the, the amount of data on consumer behavior that has now come, because what are those 2,000 items that are demanded in which city or in which neighborhood is that plan, that is a plan for that particular dark store uh, at, the, at the middle layer? then it's the plan of getting to your house. And this is really happening. There is a service where you take a picture of yourself, a high definition picture, send it to that company and ask them for passport photographs. Within 10 minutes, you'll get printed passport photographs delivered to your house. It's, I have done it. 
I can, it's not hearsay. So the level of data that has gone down and technology that has permeated um, in all aspects of business that we just talked about, but more so in, even in logistics, mm. is, is phenomenal. Mm. Uh, the, the, the second part of your question is how can that be used effectively? I think there are, uh, there are platforms now that have been created, what uh, even the last session Pranjal mentioned, something called ULIP, Unified Logistics Interface Platform, where all this data uh, is it's residing with us, but there is a certain amount of layer that we are connecting with the government or with different service providers. It could be a, a trucking service provider, it could be a payments gateway, it could be a port, it could be an airport. Um, and this la layer uh, in the tax authorities, this is available for to mine. And this is available by anonymizing data. So the, <coughs> the Indian government has created uh, a company that is going to can mine that data. And you can buy this with anonymized data. So that kind of consumer behavior is something that you can learn and implement maybe here. Because those, the LLMs that you're building, uh, basically means is you need data. And where is that going to come from? How will your own model start learning? Uh, and hence, this is going to be available. Unfortunately, in some countries like China and et cetera, you don't have a choice. You have to just give that data to the government. In this case, you have a choice. So that is one way of protection. Now, I think our countries can work together in many such areas. Um, privacy is big. The fundamental belief is that uh, intellectual property is protected in, in, uh, in a European Union country like Greece. And uh, surely it is protected in a country like India and not in some of our other countries that we talk about. We, we know for the fact that there is a high degree of trust and cooperation with uh, the shared goals, shared vision that we as our countries have. So clearly there is a scope to align more and more. Now specifically there are many areas but broadly these are some of the thoughts. Excellent. So basically, uh, there is a, a wide uh, spectrum of uh, capabilities that is just waiting to be activated at the end of the day. And all we need to do is uh, uh, moving into the implementation, the design and the implementation. Stage. I think also identification. Identification. I don't, I don't think we've identified those areas of cooperation. Very correct. Yeah. I like that because this, this panel is all about conclusions. Uh, so we are coming at, a, at an apex of uh, what we are discussing about. Uh, back to you. I wanted to ask you uh, the following. With your experience in the United States, uh, has it been um, an easy venture, if you could use that phrase, uh, with uh, respect to, uh, to bridging the gap between uh, using India as a backend, maybe? Or a, or a production facility uh, with the United States. What kind of challenges did you, did you face? Uh, my question has to do with the possibility of extrapolating what we are looking forward with respect to the cooperation with the European Union and Greece at the end. Thank you, George. Uh, I think with the United States, it's pretty much simple. Uh, they are very used to uh, cooperating on services, as an example. Mm -hmm. And that's the backbone of India and US coming along, it's a very open-ended back and forth going on. Manufacturing is a different ball game a little bit. Mm. And not so much with the technology, but with the geopolitics of it, which keeps coming back and forth. Yeah. And we are in an era at this point where geopolitics is playing so hard about uh, pushbacks and things like that. Uh, uh, you know the pushback of the United States with China, in a, in a, we're talking about a, a quad. There are all kinds of cooperations going on. Uh, I did mention somewhere in the other room that uh, I think uh, somebody wants that we can have a unipolar, bipolar world, it's okay, but a unipolar Asia. And I think that's very difficult with the rise of India. Coming to the cooperation, I think uh, it, it's not that difficult as long as the compliance of immigration Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the basic fundamentals are met. 
Uh, it's a very open thing. You can go and do and things like that. And India comes under that generalized systems of preferences. So the import duty is down to about two and a half, three percent in the United States. So that's also something one has to, when we talk about India and Greece, per se, and India and Europe, uh, my concern is, if I may say so, on a larger picture, my concern is, since we are in Europe, uh, you know, we look at Europe, anyone should look at Europe only one way, and that is that Europe is half a billion people and $20 trillion of economy. That's a huge number. But it is so fragmented. Uh, and it, we've seen that happen in the last 10 years that it just is not playing the role of what EU was originally destined for. So the cooperation also is fragmented each to each his own. I mean, uh, Greece has to take its own call and work with India. EU is not going to have an overarching, you can have policy, but I'm talking of real things happening. So wait a minute, You're, uh, let me jump in here and say the following. Would you think that uh, using Greece as an entry point, as an initial touching point, would be of, of benefit to, uh, to India as a, as a country and as a set of industries? I like uh, developing a paradigm, see how it works with, uh, with Greece as an entry point. And then you don't have to deal with everyone in the EU, uh, that is. Um, I am extrapolating on the following. Uh, there is a lot of discussion of uh, how Greece can become uh, an energy hub. The gateway and... Uh, the uh, gateway for uh, possibly uh, gas, uh, other forms of energy like electricity, uh, onto a region of uh, the southeastern Europe that is in dire need uh, of, uh, of energy. Uh, winter is coming, people are, are going to be asking questions about what's going to happen. So, uh, we have this set of issues to, to deal with. Uh, can Greece play the role of a gateway for India in that respect? Obviously, I mean, you know, the, Greece is the gateway and logistics and freight play a very important role. I mean, you cannot have every time goods in your factory and ship it. Every client needs a certain bonded warehouse at some point so that on peak consumption, they can recall that product. And Greece is very ideal for the entire European thing. Your maritime is high, your waterways are very strong, and, and it's large land, relatively lower cost compared to the other European countries. So I think, I think, Recently, we, have, we had your Honorable Prime Minister and, you know, it was in India, they were part of the dialogue, and I think something is brewing very well. But, again, my point is, I'm a realist. Talking about policy is one thing, getting it done is another thing. I, I think that unless the, whatever body it is, you call it a chamber of commerce, whatever, until they go on the, on the street and go around in both the countries, visiting 30 cities, and 30 hubs of manufacturing and services, I'm afraid this is not going to happen. Yeah. We can come up with speeches, we can have a policy doctrine, we can do this and we can do that. At the end of the day, uh, you know, implementation is something where small sectors, we're not talking of the large, we're talking of the small sector, that, that needs, it has a different nuance of doing business. Hold on to your thought. Uh, that thought is going to be part of our final rounds of, uh, of, of uh, uh, parting uh, shots, uh, as it were, because I need to uh, go to Spiros for a bit and uh, mention the following. Uh, Pritha said, not enough people for diagnostics. I'm sure you have picked this up and we have to discuss this. We yes. cannot let this go. Well, we, we do, we do, and I'll defer her to her great knowledge in this area, but um, it, <coughs> I think uh, that whole area of diagnostics and what AI will do in that space is, Pritha explained it very well, it's, uh, it's going to be, prof it is profound and it's, it's really helping with real-time diagnosis, more accurate diagnosis, less human error, all that stuff and, and obviously with more and more affordability in Greece around hospitals and hospital beds and aged care provision 
for the for the ageing population. It's it's really a um, an imperative to 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 really tap into those learnings. But it just comes back to what um, Naraj was just saying that you know, and, and I think um, you, you made the, a similar sort of point. You you really got to chunk it down and get into specifics. And I think that's a good one. That the healthcare vertical and, and remote care and care in the home is is a great example where. Greece could benefit a lot from India. What I do want to say is that, um, I mean, India has a, a great diaspora of um, entrepreneurs and businessmen, uh, case in point here, um, and so does Greece. We shouldn't lose sight, sight of that as well. So, you know, just for the Greeks in the audience, Greece has uh, some of the world's best data scientists, some of the world's best thinkers around large language models. They may not be residing in Greece, one of our big challenges, and I'm a patriot, I, I, I was born in Australia, but I'm Greek, and you know, I, it saddens me that the, the, the hardship the country went through and the brain drain. Yeah. And, and so to the extent that we can, you know, one of the areas, and I'm very passionate about this, hence why I chair an online education company, um, I think we need to, literally what's about to happen in terms of a transformation and a revolution in the way people work and live is going to be so profound, we have to equip our citizens, our people, to, to be ready for this and, and reskill them. And I do think uh, India's got some great um, uh, you know, examples, whether it's in digital identity, privacy, um, prompt engineering, all these fields, healthcare, where, where we can, there's a lot of learnings, but to, to the point that Naraj is making, you've, you've really got to chunk it down. Yeah, un, un, otherwise, it won't be concrete enough. And like, the, this is the mistake that, that humans make. We, we think that the machines think like us. They actually have a different way of learning. So we actually need to understand how to use that enabling technology for good with the right safeguards in place, but then chunk it down for specific tasks. And that's going to take time for people to understand how to apply it to specific uh, tasks, but it does require, to your point, that people actually get granular, really go out there and understand what the, do really define the problem really well that you're trying to solve. I, I want to ask you something, yeah. because this is, this is um, um, a very interesting point. We have two remote uh, places of reference, that is Greece and India. Um, we need to, uh, this is a theorem, okay, a theoretical approach. Uh, we will need to train people from India compliant with uh, the regulatory framework that exists in Greece under the European Union. Oh. Um, so, uh, are there means by using artificial intelligence uh, uh, models uh, that can enhance uh, this kind of uh, even remote education? Absolutely, yeah, I mean. And do these things exist now, or is this something that we're going to be seeing in the future? Th th they exist, and like, we have a platform, and I don't want to give my company a plug, but, but, but we do have a platform that is trying to solve problems like the one you're, you're, you're discussing, but it does, um, but with the development of these AI tools, they'll get even more accurate as you, as you, as you create autonomous feedback loops and. It, it sort of gets more data and it gets more, provided it's the <coughs> right data and it's nutritious data, it's the right sort of data that gets fed back into the, the large language model. But I think the, um, it's a good point you make, George, because th there's, I think, a wonderful opportunity to, for Greece to become a navigator for, it's more agile, it's not a big, it's not sort of distracted by a lot of the other stuff that's going on like a, for a big nation like Germany or France or whatever, we can actually be more, if we're smart, we can be more nimble and agile in helping India, the, the big emerging power, global power, to navigate into Europe. That's the opportunity for us. I see. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists. I, I was thinking about uh, giving the audience a go, if they can uh, tap into your uh, yes. brains. Uh, and uh, take some questions. We have a little bit of time. Which at 6 p.m. is like <laughs> <laughs> for everyone. I Test guess. the audience if they have been with us or done. Are yeah. we done, mate? Uh, well, okay. not here. Oh, really? We got, okay, we got some time. We have another 10 minutes. Okay.
So we would really welcome some uh, questions. I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, the panel has been uh, uh, great in, uh, in pulling together uh, various uh, fields of uh, know-how and experience. Uh, so uh, please be welcome. Oh, yes. A question. The gentleman over there. Yeah, great panel. Thanks a lot. My name is Yuri van Giest. Uh, I brought Singularity University to Europe uh, eight years ago, so focusing on AI, of course, mostly. So I've been thinking a lot about the future after artificial general intelligence, let's say singularity, the next five years, uh, predicted by Elon Musk, Sam, Sam uh, Oldman, uh, Demis Hassabis, and Ray Kurzweil. So my question to you is, what will happen after the singularity? What are the key drivers of competitive advantage or a way of, let's say, meaning and purpose for humanity when we have artificial and general intelligence? in the next five years. <laughs> and between that question yeah, and the easy. answer lies the ethics and the perils. <laughs> it, that is, it's a big question. I, 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 you know, as I said, uh, uh, China is doing its own uh, AI, the deep seek. Uh, recently, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and UAE is spending billions of dollars in creating. And my advocacy on that point coming to what India and Greece can do is, because we also have a background of civilization, and I think we should come together to create an, an, a, a, our own AI. Trust me, because that will not just give scientific solutions, but preserve the thought processes of society. What we don't realize is, every time you go and ask Chad GPT a question, and whatever answer it gives, it starts to prompt you with other questions, right? And you are being sucked in a certain way. I'm not going to define good or bad, but you're being sucked in a certain narrative. Uh, the way the next question, and then you respond, then you go deeper and deeper. And, and I think that subscribes to a certain ideology and narrative that is controlled by large corporates. And, and, and I think that's, that's, therein lies the peril. And there is no reason why India and Greece uh, cannot come together with its own AI platform. Yeah. Uh, I, I think like that right. to me is the big takeaway. It's doable yeah. uh, and, and we should, and, and nothing wrong in what is happening. Of course, it's done great, but yeah. hey, we got the expertise, let's do it. So, you so. know, there's, uh, sorry, the, yeah. there's just a little, it's on the lighter side, but AI has been bandied around as actually Indian. <laughs> so, if there are perils in it, maybe a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of, uh, you know, holding it back might, might help. But so, there are Indians minding every aspect of AI. There you go. Yeah. So, I just, to, to answer your, I just sort of thinking a little bit more about, um, hopefully it's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the singularity moment is the moment when computers ex exceed human-like intelligence and can emote. And, and it's quite a th scary thought to your point. Um, obviously, there's some, some societies, like some utopian visions that are being developed in places like Scand in parts of Scandinavia where they're developing universal basic incomes, uh, UBIs. The, the challenge, and I think this is what you're alluding to, is we, we need meaning in our lives. So we need to prepare the uh, future generations for a world of singularity, where we're coexisting with machines. And to the point that you were alluding to, Naraj, how, like, hopefully before the genie's too far out of the bottle, how do we shut them down if they just go rogue? And I know uh, President Biden's talked about, uh, I forgot, red teaming to try to identify ways to, to, to stop. Keeping a mind in the loop yeah. at some point. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's, this is like, honestly, we could talk for an hour on this, but it's a, gr it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any other questions? More than welcome. George, with your permission, uh, yes, before we sign off, uh, there is just one aspect which might have been missing in our complete dialogue. You know, we're talking about country to country collaboration. Please. Uh, you tried to say that, you know, how can uh, Greece be the front runner 
for the EU for some of the challenges which we face. And one of the points which we did not discuss, maybe for paucity of time, is the fact that sustainability, carbon footprint, and the environment. And I think that responsibility, because you know it's a beautiful country, you have fabulous islands, and uh, Europe by itself has been very environmentally conscious. You know, as, as a race, as a, a continent, but the, the consciousness of the environment has actually come in from Europe. And you cannot say the same for you know, some of the other uh, continents in, in the globe. And I think that might be one point for singularity, that might be one point for, you know, can Greece rise with the other EU, with the other countries, and talk really about sustainability in a very systematic, uh, process-driven, hardcore way, and then have ways to monitor it. And I think that somehow is, we still don't have answers. As humanity, we talk, we do, there are certain things which are done. But this might be a front runner for a lot of. That, that is uh, also very well, important. Greece is, uh, is conscious of the environment. There are many challenges. We are seeing how uh, events uh, are uh, touching um, vast swaths of the country. Uh, be that uh, with uh, uh, during the summer with uh, heat waves, exactly. uh, floods, lack of water. How does this touch into uh, agricultural activities? I wish we had in, on the panel an agricultural election, which we don't, but we would need another hour. Uh, let me give the opportunity uh, to that gentleman over there that had the question, and thank you for uh, your parting thought. Uh, Please. Just, just a comment. I think it's wonderful that uh, the name Apollo of the Apollo hospitals is derived from a Greek name, yes. from the mythology. Yes. Uh, I can't see a better uh, opportunity for having the Apollo Hospital being present in Greece and Greece reciprocate, reciprocating uh, the spirit of the Hippocratic medicine to India. So Apollo is the Greek, the sun god and the Greek god of medicine. And we wanted a, a name which was not purely Indian. And this came up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks uh, to my panelists. You've been uh, great. Thank you for joining Thank you for coming.